The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, one nation under God. Had there been no Bible, there would be no America as we know it. Robert Morgan reveals the side of our history that's not being taught in schools. Then, pro football's hallowed ground. This is the legacy of the greatest that ever played the game. Where players become legends. Go behind the scenes at the Hall of Fame on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. Battling for votes in the battleground states. President Trump and Joe Biden are both targeting swing states in the last two weeks of the campaign. Well, what encouraging word did a pastor in Nevada give President Trump about the election? And what is Joe Biden making clear what he wants in addition to the White House? Dale Hurd has that. President Trump and Joe Biden both went on offense Sunday, with each campaigning in states they're trying to flip on Election Day. Hello, North Carolina! Joe Biden was in the Tar Heel state, again criticizing the president for his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Experts say we're likely to lose as many as 200,000 additional lives nationwide between now and the end of the year. All because this president cares more about his Park Avenue perspective on the world, the stock market, than he does about you. Trump barnstormed through Florida, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nevada over the weekend. In Michigan, Trump supporters chanted, lock her up, as the president criticized the state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who pushed back, telling NBC the president is inspiring domestic terrorism. Long lines are already forming at some early voting sites, with over 26 million Americans having cast their ballots. The latest ABC News Washington Post poll shows Biden up by 12 points, the same margin Hillary Clinton held at this point in October 2016. Fearing a repeat of four years ago, the Biden campaign warned in a memo to supporters that Donald Trump can still win this race, and we need to campaign like we're trailing. And in the key battleground states where this election will be decided, we remain neck and neck with Donald Trump. Biden attended mass Sunday in Delaware. Trump went to church Sunday in Nevada, a state he's trying to win this time after narrowly losing it in 2016. One of the pastors said God gave her a word about the president. At 4.30, the Lord said to me, I am going to give your president a second win. <laughs> President again. Democrats are taking no chances. They're set to outspend Trump in Nevada in the closing days by a more than three to one margin. But the Trump campaign is hoping to make inroads with the state's Latino voters, where he's pushed his message on the economy and crime. The president also staying on the attack against Biden. If I lose, can you imagine? If I lose, I will have lost to the worst candidate the worst candidate in the history of presidential politics. In Michigan Friday, Biden made clear he wants to win more than just the White House. We can't forget that winning in November doesn't just mean defeating Donald Trump. It means winning back the United States Senate and expanding our majority in the House of Representatives. With the final debate coming up this Thursday, the president tweeted he's again expecting unfair treatment. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, we'll see how it happens. Well, you had a weekend that was full, but you always find time to sit with the Lord. Well, and just... I spent a lot of time Sunday praying and trying to straighten out uh, in my mind how prophecy was going to work. And I believe that between me and the Lord and the Bible, I've gotten the timeline of what's going to happen in the next few years. So, Can you share uh, that? Or? Well, I, maybe, maybe tomorrow. Oh. I'll come back. <laughs> you promise? Yes, I promise. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I know everybody would like to know what's going to happen. I'm not going to tell you today. <laughs> but it's going to be interesting. I mean, very, very interesting. A lot of, lot of things that I'm trying to, that I believe that the Lord, I was seriously praying on Sunday, and I, 
I do believe that I, I've gotten some word. Well, in other news, rioting breaks out in San Francisco against supporters of President Trump. So what happened? John Jessup has that. <clears throat> Well, Pat, a group of conservatives called Team Save America staged a free speech rally Saturday to protest against Twitter, which it says censors conservative speech. The protesters wore red Make America Great Trump campaign hats. Several hundred counter protesters, according to some reports uh, from Antifa, surged into the area. They outnumbered and attacked the people who had already been gathered there. One Trump supporter was taken away in an ambulance. Philip Anderson, a black man who organized the event, was hit with bottles and left with a bloody mouth and a missing front tooth. Three police officers were assaulted with pepper spray and corrosive chemicals. The San Francisco Police Department stopped the event after counter-protesters began throwing bottles, cans, and eggs. Well, women's marches were also held here in Washington and in other cities around the country, like Chicago and its suburbs protesting President Trump's nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court and encouraging women to vote. Conservative women also are active this year, uh, this election year, with a new movement hitting the road. It's called Women Fighting for America, and it's undertaking a multi-state Heal Our Land bus tour to fight for the soul of America. Wendy Griffith has the story. This is the first time in my life I've ever walked out in this kind of faith. Christy Hutcherson, founder and CEO of Women Fighting for America, says this bus tour was not her idea. God has called me. He called me in 94 and he said, Christy, you denied me. You called me in 20, I called you in 2012 and you denied me again. Are you gonna deny me a third time? And I really was bawling and I said, no. Then God took control, connecting Christy in Jacksonville, Florida, to several like-minded women on a Zoom call, including Seattle native Maureen Cowley and Michelle Swenson from the San Francisco Bay Area. It was exactly the way I was feeling. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and um, I felt a governmental call, and I just wanted to get involved. It was a no-brainer because I already knew I was supposed to do this. The multi-state tour started in late August with an urgent plea for women to put their faith into action. Mamas are the heart of the home. They're the heart of our communities. We're the heart of America. And right now in America, we have a lot of hurt. We have a lot of um, chaos and, you know, we need healing. We are going across every state. Um, we are talking about hope. We are talking about the Constitution. We are talking about the founding of this great nation. Um, we are educating women to understand what the two strategic visions are for our nation right now, because we're at a crossroads. They see overwhelming response at each stop. I had a woman crying last night at the hotel telling us thank you for what we're doing. And I think just the bravery of stepping out is going to help other women, other people, not just women, get involved in the future of our country. The group believes prayer, along with action, can help solve racial tensions and lead to possibly overturning Roe v. Wade. Every individual in our country has dig dignity and worth because we are all created in the very image of God. The group's bus tour includes events from Texas to Pennsylvania and will culminate at the National Mall in Washington, D.C., two days before the presidential election. We are called right now. We are powerful. We have a voice, and we are going to be the heart, and we are going to be the movement that literally brings back the nation to God. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Virginia Beach. Coronavirus lockdowns have taken a heavy toll on the economy and on government spending. The federal deficit hit an all-time high of $3.1 trillion in the 2020 budget year. That's more than double the previous record of $1.4 trillion set 11 years ago in 2009. The deficit came as the government poured more money into stimulus measures to keep the economy afloat during the lockdowns. Analysts warn longer term that too much government spending or too much government debt pat could hurt the economy. It's not a question of hurt, it's a question of destroy. Uh, listen, you know, like you, you just can't live borrowing money in, in an individual. If you go deep and deep and deep into the banks, the banks before long uh, own you. And what is it the borrow is the servant of the lender. 
Oh, but I mean, it's going to get to the point. We have the reserve currency of the world. But when people stop taking our dollar, right now the dollar is still very, very strong. But what will happen when people say enough? But the trouble is there's no engine that I know of anywhere in the world financially that can bail us out. And nobody, I mean, the, we, we're talking about, about oh, 200, 250 trillion dollars of debt throughout the whole world. It's staggering. It's the amount of money that nobody has ever dreamed of. It's so many zeros. And uh, how do we bail ourselves out of it? Well, the answer is we won't. There'll be default after default after default. But right now, the federal government is keeping things afloat, and for that, we all should be grateful. John? Thanks, Pat. Coronavirus cases are on the rise, but don't look for any more sweeping shutdowns. CBS's 60 Minutes asked Dr. Anthony Fauci how bad things would have to get for him to advocate a national lockdown. Here's what he had to say. They'd have to get really, really bad. First of all, the country is fatigued with restrictions. So we want to use public health measures not to get in the way of opening the economy, but to being a safe gateway to opening the economy. The U.S. is now reporting more than 50,000 new cases a day. Some experts warning that a third surge is underway and worldwide. The total number of cases is now over 40 million. Well, turning overseas to Israel, after a four-week intense lockdown, the government began lifting restrictions as new coronavirus cases dropped substantially. But as CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports, Israel is not out of the woods yet. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spread the news that Israel would exit lockdown for the second time. This time we're leaving the lockdown carefully and responsibly, exactly according to the plan proposed to us by the experts and by the Ministry of Health. As the limit on movement lifted, some businesses reopened, while daycare and preschool for children up to age six resumed. Restaurants are once again allowed to expand from just delivery to offering takeout. At Jerusalem's Western Wall, Jews are now allowed to pray in sections of up to 20 worshipers, but not everyone is included. In the red cities, we will keep the shutdown until they too reduce their morbidity data and these cities turn green. I call on the ultra-Orthodox public to follow the guidelines. The red cities are communities where the ultra-Orthodox Haredim live. While they make up only 12% of the Israeli population, their infection rate has been as much as four times higher. Haredi life is very much based on the community, on community events of coming together at the synagogue multiple times a week, as much as three times a day. And many community events, large weddings, large families, large family events, all of these contribute to a very high level of social interaction. During the recent holiday season, with its high emphasis on prayer, police closed dozens of synagogues, not abiding by the health ministry regulations. In some cases, residents turned violent, throwing rocks and rioting against police. Expert Rabbi Eliezer Isakovitz tells CBN News, many Haredi communities try to keep the rules, others don't. Some of the more extreme and insulated groups, and they really try to avoid having anything to do with the state. So naturally, when the country comes, when the government comes and starts giving out these instructions about what to do and what not to do, these extreme groups just ignore uh, the government instructions. Restrictions in those areas remain in effect until midnight Wednesday. And finally, some good news. Israel's tourism minister told an annual Christian media summit that Israel is taking advantage of this downtime for renovations to be better prepared for Christian pilgrims when they return. We are waiting for the day the skies open and flights to the Holy Land resume. Israel ties with the Christian world are unbreakable, not even by pandemic or an economic crisis. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Pat, back to you. Amazing, isn't it? Well, we, we pray for them. Uh, but you know, I, I, I don't want to denigrate anybody's religious beliefs, but some of the ultra-Orthodox, they are picking up habits because one of their rabbis in Russia dressed that way. They, he wore a hat or he wore his hair in ringlets. 
or he dressed it. You know, it's nothing to do with the Bible. But of course, we want to honor their religious practices, whatever they happen to be. But uh, we just realize that that stuff isn't in the Bible. And uh, we honor uh, their faith and, and their dedication. And of course, we are pro-Israel all the way up and down the line. So we, we pray for Israel. We're supposed to always pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Blessed are they that love thee. And, and we do that. So we pray for Israel. But uh, thank goodness they're coming out of this thing. And uh, it's uh, so important. Uh, we'll talk uh, tomorrow when I talk about some of the things that are going to be happening. I'll mention them about what, because Israel will play a key, key role in the, in the future years. All right. All right. We look forward to that. Okay. Well, coming up later, one of the most inspiring places on the face of the earth and home to the greatest that ever played the game of football. Who is the keeper of this castle? And what happens when this gentle giant comes knocking? Plus, recognize this nine-year-old? His plea for a family went viral. How many people clamored to adopt him in just 12 hours? And what crisis for children does his case highlight? This election night, with a country divided and America's future hanging in the balance, go to a place you can trust, CBN News. CBN News presents an election night special with live coverage starting at 7 p.m. Get live updates on each of the campaigns, plus analysis on the shifting balance of power. Watch November 3rd at 7 p.m. on the CBN News channel or download the CBN News app. CBN News, because truth matters. One of my favorite Bible verses is John 16, 33, where Jesus tells his disciples, in this world, trying times inevitably will come, but to take heart, I have already overcome the world. When I shift my focus from all that's wrong in the world to think about all the ways God's moving, I'm filled with so much hope. Hope for a brighter tomorrow, knowing God is working through it all. And that is good news. Tomorrow. Just how important is a single Supreme Court seat? Senator Ted Cruz shares how swing votes have changed history. And then, a pastor collapses in his car, a victim of a cardiac arrest. Watch a five-day fight for life and see how he was healed on Miracle Sunday. The House Modesto pastor Glenn Berteau joins us live on the next 700 Club. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Hey, it's the 700 Club. We're delighted to have all of you with us today. We've got a fascinating story now about a little boy, nine-year-old in Oklahoma. And this little boy made a video. What was he asking for? He said, I want a family. I want a mommy. I want a daddy. And that video went viral, highlighting the crisis of children in what's called the foster care system. The coronavirus has only intensified that crisis. So what's the solution? Charlene Aaron brings us a glimmer of hope. More than 400,000 children make up the foster care system in the United States. Experts say COVID-related family issues are likely to increase that number. But there is good news as more families show an interest in providing homes for kids in need. Family, family, those are only wishes I have. When this video of a nine-year-old Oklahoma boy named Jordan pleading for a family during a local television interview hit the web, the story went viral. I call mom and dad, or this mom, or this dad, I don't really care. In just 12 hours, thousands of inquiries poured in to adopt the boy, who had been in foster care for six years. The case highlights the crisis of children stuck in the system. I think it's roughly about 424,000 right about now, and roughly 125,000 of them are available for adoption. So pre-pandemic, we already had close to half a million kids in foster care. Kimberly Offit of Bethany Christian Services says lives are being disrupted with many seeing a rise in substance abuse, domestic violence and financial struggles. 
pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, you were already stressing, you were already um, didn't have the support system that you needed. Now you add the loss of jobs, the loss of income, you know, trying to, to teach your children at home. It's a lot of stress for our family. So you're seeing that increase in violence and increase in everything now. That's why Bethany is offering families much needed support, such as meals, transportation, and babysitting hoping to keep them from putting their children in foster care. Through its Safe Families Ministry, volunteers help vulnerable families by temporarily taking in their children while the parents regain stability. Those families really step in the gap when you have families in crisis. Mm -hmm. So our goal as an organization is to really keep families intact. Bethany has also gone virtual to offer information, training, and licensing for those interested in foster care and adoption. We've seen that a 55% increase an interest in foster care parenting during the pandemic. And that's encouraging because you see communities are responding to the needs of their neighbors. Families who found themselves with more free time, yeah. they're able to learn more about foster care and the licensing process and to be able to do that from the comfort of their home. Another emerging trend, more single parents getting involved. A lot of families think, well, if I'm not married, I can't be a foster parent mm -hmm. or I can't adopt. And that's not true. We have family um, teenagers who may have experienced um, some really bad trauma and they may not be comfortable in a two parent home. Mm -hmm. So there is a need for single parents to serve our kids as well. Meanwhile, to raise awareness for foster care and adoption amid the pandemic, Bethany will host a virtual event called Family Changes Everything, featuring Francis Chan, Christian rap artist Lecrae, and others. You hear the message and prayerfully be compelled to move forward and be a, a foster family, adopt, or support us in our efforts. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, the Family Changes Everything, a virtual event, is going to take place tomorrow. And you can find out more information on our website at cbnnews.com. It's a wonderful work they're doing, and we congratulate them. Absolutely. I, used to, I wouldn't have dreamed that there are many millions of people. And of course, families are breaking up. They want to get rid of their children. They're yeah, trying to, they, they can't. You know, I think it's often economic issues, sure. sometimes drug issues, and I don't think they want to break up. I just think it happens, and kids are always the... Well, the the they just pawns po and victims. Yes. Well, God loves the little children. Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, so many critical issues facing our nation right now. And for the past month, we've been continually praying for our country in the days leading up to the election. If you haven't joined us yet, you still can. Please call 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to PrayForAmerica.com. You can also text PRAY to 71777. So, Pat, will you lead us right yeah, now absolutely. in prayer for our country? And folks, you know, we... we as was said some years ago, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. We can always curse the darkness. The darkness is always there. You can say, isn't it awful what they're doing? Isn't it terrible what is happening? Isn't Antifa awful? Isn't this uh, radical group awful? Aren't what they're doing terrible? Or, you know, the country's going to hell in a handbasket and all that. But if we pray, mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm so grateful for Jonathan Kahn and that return. It has had a ma major impact, and God is going to hear the prayers of his people. So we're going to pray right now. So join with us in prayer mm -hmm. as we believe God for this nation. Father, we hold before you this nation, not just an election, Lord, not just one party over another party, but that this nation might be healed. Lord, is that word that you give shalom, Peace, my peace I give unto you. May the peace of God come into our heart. And may the joy of the Lord be of the strength of this nation. Lord, give us reconciliation and give us unity and give us love. We know your commandment that we should love each other and help us in this nation to love one another. In Jesus' name we ask, because you are going to send an answer. Amen. Amen. And amen. Terry. Well, up next, Elite Company, 326 bronze busts of the greatest that have ever played the game of football. 
What does it take to make it into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? And why is this place much bigger than the game itself? Stay tuned for an exclusive tour. And then later on, your questions and honest answers. Michaela wants to know, is eating too much a bad thing in God's eyes? And what can I do to stop eating excessively? I know Pat's got an answer to that one, and that's coming <laughs> Absolutely. up. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you need prayer? We as a CBN family want to help you out. Let us know what you're praying for in the comment section below. Imagine being in a room with the greatest football players of all time. Well, what would these guys say to each other about commitment, courage, and talent that it takes to land in the pro Football Hall of Fame. We'll just ask David Baker. He's the president and CEO of what he calls the most inspiring place on earth. I think that's a little bit of a misstatement, <laughs> but uh, uh, I won't diminish his love for the sport. Tom Buring spoke about this gentle giant about what it's like to come knocking on the door of greatness. It's football's iconic shrine, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, where all players hope to be, but very few elected. Bronze and enshrined, the game's greats wait for their call. When David Baker, the hall's CEO and president, comes knocking. David, why is this building and those enshrined in it revered? You know, Tom, the, the reason the Pro Football Hall of Fame is here is because this is where the game started. And 10 teams came together here in Canton and created this incredible thing. You're in one of the greatest rooms on the face of the earth. We call it the most inspiring place on earth. This is the legacy of the greatest that ever played the game. And there's only 326 bronze busts here. That is elite company. And I think people, when they come into this, they feel the excellence. Thank you, man. Are you ready? Yes, sir. On behalf of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's my privilege to welcome you to Canton, Ohio. I want to thank you for all you've done for the game, for all you're going to do for the game. <laughs> this is going to be the beginning of your journey, not the end of your football career. If this is the castle, you are the courier. When you look into the eye of a recipient who has finally reached the ultimate of their NFL ambition, what do you see? You know, they're not thinking about their records or their money or their rings. They're thinking about their mom who drove them to practice when they were 10 years old, or their dad who wouldn't let them quit, or that coach who put his arm around them and made them think that they could be more, or that teammate that sacrificed for them to help get them here. And I think guys feel at that moment a legacy, uh, affirmation, a redemption, that somebody said, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for all you've done for this great team, Man. Okay, buddy. So much, Mr. Baker. God bless you, buddy. God bless you. Buddy. Oh, man, you're so deserving. That's your signature, affirming them. Yeah. What is the impact? Yeah, I think this is very important, Tom, because this isn't about the worship of football heroes. Every one of these guys did not fall out of bed great. They earned it. To be in this group is a huge affirmation, because all of these guys had times when they weren't sure the commitment, the integrity, the courage, the respect, the love, those values to drag a lot of other people to greatness. It might make us better fathers or better mothers, better companies, make us a better country. It's bigger than football, Tom. Why the connection to the fan? People will stand in line just to, to be with these bronze busts. Football is a game that has captured America's passion. It's the only sport where every player needs every teammate on every play just to survive. And that's kind of a great metaphor for life. We need each other every day. If you're playing at Lambeau Field, there's a frozen tundra stuck in your face mask. And you have to fight to get through it. Whether it's Aaron Rodgers or Roger Staubach, throw a Hail Mary. They've seen that, you know, it's never over until the end. There's always hope. What do these high achievers all have in common? I think that common of believing in something of believing that they could, believing in each other, introduce Jim Brown and all the other Hall of Famers stand up. The perseverance and the never giving up, but also what he did for social reform. He translated that to life. 
But I'll tell you, at our enshrinement, when we go back and do the transcripts, the word love is used 140, 150 times. They loved the game, they loved each other, and they wouldn't let anything stop them. What kind of a conversation, if they could have one, would go on here? You, you know, Tom, this is John Madden. I don't think I've ever known anybody who loved the game more than him. Mm -hmm. And in his enshrinement speech, he said that when the last fan had left during the day and the janitor had turned out the lights, that he was absolutely convinced that these guys talked to each other. I will say that their legacies talk to each other. Uh, their legacies speak to me. I know in particular, Derek Brooks was concerned about where he was going to be, because he's going to be right across from Warren Sapp. And he thought he'd never get any sleep, <laughs> never get any peace. David, it's fitting to me that it takes a man bigger than other big men to usher them into something larger than life. Do you ever wonder, why me in this specific role? My mom and dad couldn't read or write, and if it wasn't for a whole lot of coaches and this game, I don't think I would have the beliefs. I wouldn't have been able to persevere through the mistakes I've made in life. I wouldn't hold these principles so dear. The values that I've learned in athletics are very similar in a lot of respects to what I've learned by following Jesus Christ and what scripture talks about. What would the bust of Jesus Christ read? Yeah, I think it would either just say love or would say, come to me. Now he had power and he had force and he had truth, but he would understand their hurt. Somehow it was so powerfully done in love that it was different. He wanted to heal their wound. This is the greatest job in the world, I'll tell you. I get to give out the gold jacket, I get to give the Hall of Fame ring of excellence in their state in front of their fans, but I also get to knock on their door. It has all the elements of eternity, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, Tom. When I've knocked on the door, I've looked into their eyes, and I think I've got a glimpse of their soul. They're thinking about their journey. Even a bronze bust only lasts for 40,000 years. Our life in Jesus Christ is that that is forever. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. And any man who answers the door, I will come in, and there will be a union between Jesus Christ and me. All you have to do is humble yourself and answer the door. And, and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and eternity is a lot longer than 40,000 years. Well, it's an interesting parallel, isn't it? Uh, uh, you know, it's amazing how we make heroes out of people who uh, throw a, a little piece of pig filled with air uh, through the air and this uh, Well, that simplifies yeah. it a bit, but we, yes. Uh, we have a, ball, a round ball and we throw it up through a hoop and they become heroes and we take a piece of, of, of hickory wood or whatever it is and we hit a ball and um, you know, we, we take another racket and hit another ball and, and somehow we make all these guys heroes. But it's nice to, to see this thing brought to a spiritual conclusion. It really is. I mean, praise God. Okay, Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, a YouTube favorite, your questions and honest answers. Isabel says, my brother sexually molested me when I was young. Can I forgive him and not have anything to do with him anymore? What will Pat say to that? Plus, what's the connection between the Bible and 100 key moments in America's history? Stay tuned to find out. Join our CBN family today. Simply click the link below in the description box. And welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Businesses in China are being banned from publishing religious materials not approved by the government. A religious liberty and human rights publication in China called Bitter Winter reports those who violate the strict orders face punishment. Officials reportedly have searched printing shops and other locations with rigorous inspections. Anyone who breaks the law can face fines, see their businesses closed, or be put in prison. Well, CBN's Orphans Promise is helping out those in need in one of the world's hardest hit regions by the coronavirus. More than 10 million COVID cases have been reported throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. With economies so badly hurt, many parents are out of work, leaving them unable to feed their children. So Orphans Promise has stepped in, helping at-risk families feed their children in the short term 
and launching home-based businesses to create lasting income. As these children and families live through so much uncertainty, Orphan's Promise is a constant source of hope. You can find out more about what Orphan's Promise is doing around the world by visiting orphanspromise.org. Pat and Terry will be back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Do you need prayer? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000. Tomorrow, just how important is a single Supreme Court seat? Senator Ted Cruz shares how swing votes have changed history. And then a pastor collapses in his car, a victim of a cardiac arrest. Watch a five day fight for life and see how he was healed on Miracle Sunday. The House Modesto pastor, Glenn Berto, joins us live on the next 700 Club. Well, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. Pat, this first one comes from Michaela, who says, is eating too much a bad thing in God's eyes, and what can I do to stop the habit of excessive eating? All, right. all right, first of all, here's the deal. The Bible says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so therefore, we need to look after it. We don't need to take uh, noxious chemicals into ourselves. We don't need to be taking drugs or alcohol or tobacco or these things, because they destroy our bodies, and that's the sin against God. But what about too much? We have made a big thing about this, these trillions of little uh, bacteria that inhabit the intestinal flora of human beings, and when they are balanced properly, there is no desire to overeat. But when they, when they are not proper, when we kill them through antibiotics, through uh, diet drinks, through uh, the various substances we take, when that kills that intestinal flora, we replace it with flora that demands to get fed. And those bad bacteria take over your brain and they make you crave junk food. And so the more you crave, the fatter you're going to get because the, those little fellows are, are asking to be fed. What you need to do is to make sure that you, your gut is settled up. Take those probiotics, take those prebiotics, and you can get some that have as many as uh, 50 billion units, uh, you know, for uh, one dose. and you know, build up that intestinal flora. But yeah, I know it takes willpower and all the rest of it, but 21 days is what it does to take to get in the habit, 21 days. So you don't eat junk food and all of a sudden you'd be amazed what will happen, okay? Okay, this is Isabel who says, I have an older brother and sister whom I have helped financially, even paid their rent and bills. They have not been treating me well and sometimes send me nasty messages. My brother sexually molested me when I was young and my sister believes in spirit guides. My question is, can I forgive them and not have anything to do with them anymore? What do you say, Pat? Um, you know, first of all, remember, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he had been beaten, he had been falsely accused, he was crucified, and yet on the cross he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Now, I, you need to have forgiveness, and the Bible says, when you stand praying, if you have ought against any, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. If you want to have miracles in your life, you have to have a forgiving spirit. So even if you were sexually molested, even if the people have been mean to you, even if they've done all these things, you and your heart need to forgive them. Now, does that mean you have to expose yourself to abuse all the time? No, I don't think so. There's nothing in the Bible, in my opinion, that says you've got to do that. Uh, so the Bible says don't have fellowship with ungodliness. So you, you don't have to do that. But you do have to have a forgiveness because you want God to forgive you because you want miracles, all right? Mm -hmm. This is Jerry who says, I was recently told by God to, quote, let go and receive my blessings. Then he informed me that I was physically carrying grief. It is the cause of my ailment. I didn't know that I held on to grief from my son's untimely death. How do I let go of grief that I never knew I held? <laughs> well, uh, look, the way you let go of grief is to focus on the Lord. If your mind is on <clears throat> your grief, if you say to God, Lord, I am so sad. I, I can't tell you how sad I am. 
I LOVED HIM SO MUCH, AND NOW HE'S GONE, AND I'M SO SORRY. IF YOU KEEP SAYING THAT, YOU WILL REINFORCE THE GRIEF. BUT IF YOU SAY, I THANK YOU, LORD, THAT HE IS WITH YOU, AND FROM THIS MOMENT ON, I, I, I'M GOING TO WALK WITH YOU, AND I WILL LOOK FORWARD TO YOUR BLESSING. AND IF YOU BEGIN TO PRAISE THE LORD, YOU'LL BE FREE OF THAT AS WELL. SO, I MEAN, OTHERWISE, YOU'LL HAVE WHATEVER YOU KEEP TELLING YOURSELF ABOUT, AND YOU'VE GOT TO CONFESS SOMETHING DIFFERENT, OKAY? This is Robert who says, I believe that when a loved one has passed away, it's never goodbye, it's just see you later. Is it true that we can be reunited with our loved ones in paradise? Well, I, I think definitely. I, th I think there'll be great reunions in heaven, but remember, there won't be a sexual union. It'll be like the angels. There won't be marriage and giving in marriage. Mm -hmm. So you, you won't have reproduction of that kind, but in terms of love and for. And family relations, I, I see absolutely no reason why not. All right. This is Lorraine who says, I love watching the 700 Club. Does God answer every prayer if it's prayed in faith? Is this true in your journey? Uh, well, you, you know, God answers prayer, but He also says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, uh, that I uh, uh, will not receive anything from the Lord. So uh, it also says, a double minded man. Uh, will receive nothing from God. So, I, you know, you have to have your mind unified. But I do believe that when you pray in faith in the name of Jesus and you have no sin in your heart and you're not holding resentment in your heart, you will have an answer to your prayer. It may take a while. It may be instant, but uh, you, you'll have an answer. Okay. Well, that's all the time for well, today, thank but you thank for you. Questions are terrific. God Absolutely. bless you. Absolutely. Well, when the COVID pandemic hit, Chastity lost half her income. As a single mom, she was struggling to pay the bills and put food on the table. So where did she turn for help? And how did she and her children get much more than they bargained for? Take a look. Chastity is a single mother who loves spending time outdoors with her children. When the COVID pandemic forced them to stay inside and disrupted her income, she didn't know where to turn. I lost half of my pay half of my income for a couple of months. It was very hard um, trying to make my car payment and trying to keep everything paid by myself as a single mom. She knew she needed help. That's when some friends told her about Operation Blessing Partner Open Door Church in Burleson, Texas. My daughter likes to bake and it was when we went to Operation Blessing, they, they loaded my car up, I mean, completely full and they brought three or four dozen eggs and she just lit up. She was just so excited and there were so many kind people there and it was a huge blessing. And my daughter, I mean, she'll probably never forget it, you know, and it's, it was just eggs, but it was the thought behind that. And she literally went home and made a bunt cake and, you know, decorated her cake and it, it made her weak. Thanks to Operation Blessing Partners, Chastity was able to get the help she needed to feed her children. I want to thank everyone who gave to Operation Blessing. I know I personally was very, very blessed by Operation Blessing, and one day I would love to give back. That is a heartfelt thank you from Chastity, a single mom whose life was touched by you if you're a 700 Club member. Did you see the line of cars at that food distribution point at that church? That's because there are so many people right here in America who are hurting right now with the pandemic. We want to say thank you, 700 Club members, because you're allowing us to make a difference right at their point of need. If you're not a 700 Club member, I can't think of a better time to join. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a member and you're joining with thousands of us who are out to be there for folks when they're hurting here in America and around the world. So will you call our toll free number and join today? If you're already a 700 club member, listen, go up to the next club level. You can't know what a difference that can make. You have lots of options to choose from. 700 club gold is a gift of $40 a month. We've got a thousand club, a 2,500 club. Ask God what he'd have 
have you to do. And then call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do our way of saying thank you is to send you this gift. It's Gordon's teaching on the name of God. It's filled with wisdom from the Word of God about who he says he is and who he wants to be to you. It's, it'll be a blessing to you and you'll be a blessing to someone else. So call now, 1-800-700-7000. Well, up next, meet the man who knows 100 Bible verses that made America great. How many can you name? Think about it. We'll be right back. The Name of God, a new teaching from Gordon Robertson. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Gain important insights into the protection available to you in the name of God. Discover how God is our healer, our provider, and the one who gives us peace. Plus, see exciting true stories of God's providence in the lives of real people. You get the answer to everything, and that answer will never leave you. The Name of God, available now. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe and let us know where you're watching from in the comments below. The Bible is the word of life. You will find it full of the things you've wondered about and been troubled about all your life. That's a quote from Woodrow Wilson and just one example of how the Bible has influenced America's history. Take a look. Robert Morgan is a Nashville pastor, author, speaker, and a lover of American history. He believes that without the Bible, our nation would not have been born as it was. Had there been no Bible, there would be no America as we know it. In his latest book, 100 Bible Verses That Made America, Pastor Morgan explains the vital connection between God's Word and 100 key moments in America's history. It's a wonderful book, and we welcome to the 700 Club, Robert Morgan. It's good to have you with us. Your, Thank you, Terry. Your new book is an ambitious undertaking. What inspired you to do this? Everybody, every other group is trying to have their contributions included in our textbooks and their story written and rewritten, sometimes in a revisionist uh, way, particularly secularist and and other groups that may not be healthy for our children. And at the same time, the textbooks and the schools are pushing out the genuine contributions made by the Puritans and the Pilgrims and by Christians all through our history. And as much as they want to push that material out, I want to push it right back in and let people know about the role the Bible has played in our history. Talk about that a little bit. How pervasive is the Bible's influence on America's history? Well, people are talking a great deal now about Jamestown and the introduction of slavery in 1619, but they forget about the fact that the very next year, 1620, the Puritans came, the Pilgrims came, and tens of thousands over the next 20 or 30 years flooded into Cape Cod and Boston and New England and established the basis for abolition, the basis for civil liberties, a desire for freedom of speech, and set the stage for the Judeo-Christian morality that has guided our nation. And that became a tremendous force against mm -hmm. the slavery that was introduced in 1619 by the secularist in Jamestown. The founding fathers knew and loved the Bible and the Great Awakening paved the way for the Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence. So much depends upon the power of the Scripture in our early days and throughout our history. You talk about Abraham Lincoln in the book and how he was influenced by the Bible. He actually, as a young man, was uh, at best, I would say, an agnostic and possibly atheistic until he had his own encounter with Christ. Yes, he was very uh, anti-Christian uh, anti and, and anti-biblical. He, in fact, as a young man, uh, as an infidel, he um, wrote a book attacking Christianity, which a friend of his burned because he said, if this is ever published, then no one is ever going to vote for you. Uh, 
But later, Lincoln found in his father-in-law's library a book about apologetics, why it is that Christianity can be demonstrated to be true. And this book influenced him a great deal. And then as he got into the White House and into the tremendous burdens, he turned increasingly to the Bible. And the last words he spoke at Ford's Theater were to his, uh, to his wife, um, Mary Todd, and he said, when this war is over and we're out of the White House, let's travel abroad. Let's go to Jerusalem and see where the Savior lived. And at that moment, the bullet struck him. He moved from near atheism to, uh, to a place of loving the Bible and quoting it continually. Well, tell us a little bit about the great moment in history that took place on that American transport ship, the Dorchester. Well, this was during World War II. It was in uh, February, very cold weather of 1942. The Dorchester was uh, a military transport ship that was taking American troops to Europe, and it was fired upon by a German torpedo. And many lives were lost as the ship went down that frigid water. But there were four chaplains. You know, Terry, chaplains have been a part of the United States military from, um, from Bunker Hill. It was the Puritan preachers who uh, advocated freedom of religion, and, uh, and they joined the fight as chaplains. Well, there were four chaplains many centuries later on the Dorchester, and as that ship went down, those chaplains gave their life preservers, they gave their gloves, they gave their coats, they gave their, their, even their shoes to these men who were jumping overboard. And the last time anybody ever saw these four chaplains, they were going down with the ship and they perished there. And President Truman said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends as he dedicated a memorial to these four brave chaplains. The chaplaincy of our military forces has been a tremendous part of our heritage with all of our branches of service. Our country is in such a, a divided and crucial place right now. It was encouraging to me as I read your book to read about how it's happened before and there was spiritual restoration. What do you want people to take away from your book and remember about the foundation of our country? We, we just can't go forward, Terry, if we don't look backwards at the Bible on which our nation was founded. And we need a spiritual revival. It was the Great Awakening that paved the way for the American Revolution. It was the Second Great Awakening that established the morality of America for 200 years. And we need political help and we need economic help, but we need a revival. We need another Great Awakening right now because our problems in our nation are not primarily political. They are primarily spiritual, and God can heal us if he will revive us again, that his people can rejoice in him. Well, I want to say the book, 100 Bible Verses That Made America, is an excellent place to refresh your history of how the Bible impacted our country. It's available where books are sold. Robert Morgan, thank you so much. It's great to have you here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Terry. I want to suggest you get a copy of it. We should all remember it or read it and remember where we come from. Pat? Tremendous guest. God bless you. I hope that book does well. Well, today's Power Minute again is from the Bible, Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Well, tomorrow we understand that Senator Ted Cruz is going to talk about us. We talk about how one vote to the Supreme Court, one vote away, would have made a huge difference in our in our life. So you don't want to miss that. He's he's written a very very popular book, and we look forward to seeing him. So until then, thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Supreme Court seat. Senator Ted Cruz shares how swing votes have changed history. And then a pastor collapses in his car, a victim of a cardiac arrest. Watch a five-day fight for life.
and see how he was healed on Miracle Sunday. The House Modesto pastor, Glenn Berto, joins us live on the next 700 Club. The Name of God, a powerful teaching from the Christian Broadcasting Network. God repeats over and over that He is with us. You'll see exciting, true stories of God's providence in the lives of real people. The Name of God brings peace and security. It brought me so much peace in a time of turmoil. The Name of God provides for your needs. It just took me to a place of joy. The Name of God strengthens and protects. And I've never been more sure that I was gonna be protected. Plus, you'll be encouraged by Gordon Robertson's special teaching on the Name of God. And when you start thinking about good things, those are the things that God provides. Become a CBN partner to get your DVD copy of The Name of God. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com.